Alright, welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our talks today. We'll again have four talks uh, uh, today, and after the first two, we'll have a coffee break in the lobby here, and uh, then we'll be a short Q&A after each talk. Uh, so this is our second session, uh, the conference uh, Machine Learning and AI, uh, Conceptual and Ethical Frontiers. And uh, I'm happy to begin today by introducing uh, S. Matthew Lau, who's a uh, professor of philosophy and bioethics at New York University. He's the director of the Center of Bioethics there, and he's written widely on bioethics and AI, and is the uh, editor of recent uh, anthology, uh, Ethics of AI, uh, Oxford University Press. So, I'm going to go ahead and Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so, today I'm going to be talking about the ethics of AI in healthcare. So let's see. Uh, There we go. So there's a lot of interest in using AI in the healthcare context. Uh, AI has already been used to in sort of uh, for cancer, for example, uh, also to identify things like heart rhythm of abnormalities, uh, diagnose various eye diseases, and also identify viable embryos. But before we can actually use AIs in clinical settings, it's very important that we have a good ethical framework for thinking about whether we should be using some of these technologies. And in recent years, there have been a great number of uh, ethical frameworks that have been put forward. So uh, today, there are over 80 such frameworks uh, that have been proposed. Uh, and these frameworks have some things in common. So for example, they all tend to appeal to the four principles of biomedical ethics. Things like uh, beneficence, uh, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice. So beneficence says that you know AI technology should uh, work to benefit the patient. Uh, non-maleficence says you know the AI technology shouldn't harm the patients. Um, autonomy says that you know when you employ these technologies, you should make sure that uh, the patients understand what these technologies will do to them uh, and they consent. Uh, to these particular applications. Uh, and in addition to sort of these four principles, uh, there's also something called explicability, uh, which is uh, this idea that somehow we need to be able to trust or understand what these algorithms are doing. And at the same time, there have been also other principles. So in addition to these uh, four principles plus trust, uh, the Future of Life uh, Institute, for example, has said that value alignment should be an ethical principle. It should be part of sort of our ethical framework. And value alignment basically says something like uh, the AI algorithm should be aligned with human values. Uh, and uh, Microsoft, for example, has another clause that says inclusivity, right? Uh, it, you know, sort of AI algorithm should be inclusive. Now, it's, in one sense, it's really great that these uh, uh, institutions and organizations are, uh, you know, they, they care enough about ethics to come up with these ethical frameworks. But in another sense, um, you know, all these frameworks, uh, and they're so different, they raise a bunch of questions. Uh, for example, how do we come up with these, uh, these uh, principles, right? What grounds them, what justifies them? And more importantly, how can, how can we use them in practical settings to actually do something, you know, uh, to promote uh, patients' welfare? And the problem is that uh, these ethical frameworks, they actually don't tell you how to do that. So they basically just list a bunch of things that, you know, things like, oh, there should be trust, or there should be transparency, or there should be autonomy. But they don't really tell you how they arrive at these principles. And so as a result, uh, some people have said that, you know, this is really a kind of ethics washing uh, where uh, like institutions are just trying to 
sort of uh, you know pay lip service to this idea that F is important, maybe to forestall governmental regulation. So elsewhere, I've uh, developed you know in my work, I've developed something. It's a it's a human rights framework. Specifically, I developed something called the fundamental conditions approach. And I've applied that sort of in uh, to various issues in healthcare, and so I'm writing a book right now. It's called The Future Brain, and I've sort of talked about that in that context as well. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to suggest that the fundamental conditions approach also gives us a substantive framework for how to think about these issues, and I'm going to try to illustrate that. So before I begin, uh, it's useful to start by just sort of saying a bit about what AI is. Uh, we got a really good lecture from uh, Zach Lipton yesterday about how it works. And I'll just very briefly go over this uh, again. So there's no agreed upon definition of AI. Uh, we can uh, broadly understand it as sort of, you know, it's getting to do what um, sort of, you know, do things that when uh, human beings do them, you know, it, it, you know, it seems like uh, like it seems that you know there's sort of co cognition involved or emotions involved and so on and so forth, and they're solving specific problems. Um, and AI can take many forms. So one is uh, symbolic AI, and that's just uh, sort of uh, a, a various sort of explicit if-then rule statements. Uh, there's another form which is machine learning. So it's sort of learning using. Uh, uh, you know, algorithms to learn, they can learn on their own without being specifically told how to do it. Uh, whoops. So, and, you know, within machine learning, there are sort of different types of machine learning. So there's supervised learning, which is where uh, you get a data set and you label the data set accordingly. Then you, you know, use that to sort of figure out uh, you know, once you figure out the input and output, you then apply that to sort of new uh, data sets. Uh, there's also unsupervised learning. This is where you don't label the data set and you just get the algorithm to kind of sort things out on its own. And then there's, of course, reinforcement learning, which is, has been really powerful. And that's a, basically you kind of have this algorithm that does this thing by trial and error, and it kind of figures out things, and you reward it if it does it, you know, if it sort of gets something right, and you sort of punish it if it doesn't. And all of this can be combined with uh, deep uh, learning, uh, which sort of uh, basically you, uh, use, uh, uses different layers of nodes uh, that are increasingly abstract to get at sort of like abstract features of things. Now, as impressive as uh, machine learning is, it's, it also has a host of problems. So one problem is that um, it needs a lot of data to work. Uh, so, for example, supervised uh, learning algorithms can work when they, you know, when they have a lot of data. Uh, but the problem with that is that, um, you know, that means that it, this incentivizes, whoops, this thing is kind of finicky. I don't have a clicker. Uh, okay, whoops. Uh, so it incentivizes companies to uh, go out and get a lot of data, right? And so this, you know, and then that runs into problems of privacy. So take, for example, the, NA, uh, the NHS in the UK, they uh, gave about uh, 1.6 uh, million uh, data uh, to sort of Google DeepMind. Uh, it's, you know, sort of uh, something to do with kidney. And at the time, Google DeepMind said that they weren't going to, you know, they're going to keep the information private and they're sort of a sep separate subsidiary from Google, so everything will be okay. But of course, subsequently, uh, Google, you know, decided that there wasn't going to be that division between Google and Google DeepMind. And then, you know, a lot of people were sort of up in arms about, uh, you know, the, the security and safety of the patient data. Another example is uh, GlaxoSmithKline when they bought, uh, uh, you know, 23andMe, and so they were, you know, basically trying to get a lot of genetic information data and uh, of individuals, and so all these things raise uh, issues, uh, you know, sort of relating to privacy. Whoops. Um, okay, 
So another problem with uh, machine learning is that it's only as good as the data from which it learns, right? So this is the garbage in, garbage, garbage out problem. So if you have bad data and you're gonna get um, sort of, um, you're gonna get bad results. Uh, and um, so for example, there are these algorithms that were tra trained on gender imbalanced, you know, uh, sort of uh, data sets. And as, as, as a result, it sort of gave bad predictions. Uh, similarly, there were sort of some algorithms that, you know, they, they were trained only on sort of certain demographics, so white male subjects, for example, and then as a result, uh, they don't do very well on people uh, of color. There's also, in addition, so one problem is data collection, right? You, you know, sort of, uh, if you have incomplete data sets, you're gonna get into problems. The other problem is slightly different, which is that the algorithms themselves might be problematic, right? So if you have a bad algorithm, then even if you collect it, uh, if, even if you have representative data set, it's still gonna get you the bad results. Um, an example of this is uh, sort of in Arkansas, for example, they, they had this algorithm that was distributing sort of healthcare, you know, deciding who gets certain benefits. And they actually, a lot of people were denied benefits who needed benefits because they coded uh, for uh, dialysis wrong and, you know, and sort of cerebral palsy. And so uh, many people actually died from, from the algorithm. And fourthly, sort of uh, deep learning is a black box that raises issues of, uh, you know, sort of interpretability, explicability, right? So even, uh, even uh, people who program uh, these deep learning models don't really know exactly what it's doing, sort of, you know, as it's sort of, it, it, it's, it's sort of running. Um, and this raises uh, problems because, it, say, in the sort of healthcare settings, you want to know, um, uh, you know, patients. So say there's a patient and uh, you tell them that, hey, you're going to be, you have a 77% chance of getting cancer within the next five years, right? And, uh, but it doesn't sort of say the algorithm tells you that, but it doesn't tell you like why that's the case. It doesn't say you have a 77% chance of getting uh, cancer in five years because you have back problems, you're over a certain uh, age and so on and so forth. And without that explanation, uh, it's very hard for humans to understand like, you know, what, like how do I trust this algorithm, right? Like uh, um, how do I know it's gonna work? How do, how do I know that it applies to me? Uh, and so on and so forth. And we also don't know like what, uh, what type of actions I should take, you know, if the algorithms themselves just say, look, you're gonna have a 77% chance of getting cancer, but doesn't tell you how you're gonna get it. So are there ways to address, uh, I just wanna mention briefly, uh, some of the ways where people have tried to address this uh, black box problem uh, from a technical perspective. So one thing that's been really interesting is some, something called uh, uh, interpretable you know, AI. So they basically try to create um, uh, like uh, sort of after the black box, they try to create another node where they try to interpret what ha what's happening in sort of this, the, the black box. Um, and you might think, you know, that and the idea is that, you know, if we have something that can interpret what's happening in the box box, that'll make the black box more explainable and understandable. But I think this faces a bit of a philosophical conundrum. So uh, it's, it's, you can kind of understand it in form of a dilemma. So either this black box is sort of, uh, either this uh, interpretable uh, machine learning is uh, you know, getting at exactly the right features, right? It understands, you know, what's going on in the black box. In which case, why do you need the black box in the first place, right? So you can just get rid of the black box. Um, or it doesn't understand, it's missing certain things. It, it's not completely, uh, you know, predictive of what's happening in the black box. In which case, uh, well, <laughs> this thing does, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it's no good, right? Because it's not really, uh, there is, it suggests that there's something more to the black box. The black box is doing more than what this interpretable uh, layer is doing. And this might be a way of testing uh, actually what the black box is doing. Um, okay, other people have said, well, maybe we shouldn't just, you know, we shouldn't care about, 
interpretability or whether you know this thing can explain anything you know with these black boxes as, as long, long as they, they work, work what's the problem right as long as they can kind of uh you know identify cancer accurately or sort of uh you know figure out what you know which embryos are viable and so on and so forth that that should be good enough um the problem is that uh and, and you know some people have said that uh, actually, it's the same with medicine. In, in cases of medic, uh, medication, there are a lot of things we don't know. For example, we don't know, uh, um, you know, sort of why um, uh, salicylic acid works, right? It, like why aspirin works. Uh, but the problem uh, with that argument is that in the case of aspirin, we know about sal salicylic acid. We know that there, you know, we know some properties about salicylic acid. Whereas in the case of the deep learning, the black uh, the black boxes, we just really don't know what it's doing. Um, and why is this a problem? Well, you know, so uh, as many of people here know, there are sort of uh, there are instances of adversarial attacks. So this is a one pixel attack. So uh, you know, if you just look at the image of the ship, they basically just removed one pixel from the image of the ship. And now it predicts with 99.7%, you know, sort of like confidence that it's really a car. Um, and it gets even worse. So here's, you know, in the case of the panda, they removed about 0.0% of uh, sort of pixels. Uh, they just changed it, and, you know, using some sort of filter. And basically it's imperceptible perceptible to you and me. Uh, but now the algorithm says that actually it's a given. Um, and why is all this a problem? Well, it turns out that you can do the same thing with medical imaging. So here's a, uh, they did this adversarial attack on sort of a cancer uh, cell and sort of, it sort of, uh, it, it misclassifies uh, it. So now I'm going to say a bit about the fundamental uh, conditions approach, the human rights framework. So. Uh, I basically start out by saying that human beings have human uh, rights to what I call the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So what's a good life? Uh, roughly, it's this idea that, you know, there are various basic activities that we should be pursuing, things like deep personal relationships, uh, pursuing knowledge, maybe active pleasures, and, uh, you know, like sports and things like that, and passive pleasures such as appreciating beauty. And so from these uh, basic activities, we can derive what I call fundamental conditions. So these are goods, capacities, and options that you need to pursue the basic activities. So for example, you need food, water, and air. These are the goods uh, that, you know, in order to pursue the basic activities. You also need certain basic capacities, things like being able to think, being able to interact with other people, being able to have interpersonal relationships, being able to have autonomy, decide, you know, your life course, being able to do things, have liberty. Uh, and then there are also options, like social options, meaning like there needs to be social structures that allow you to do those type of things. Um, and I think the fundamental conditions approach can help us, uh, for example, explain why a number, of, a, a number of the ethical principles that are in these uh, various ethical frameworks are in fact genuine ethical principles. So take respect and autonomy. Right? Uh, is that, why is that an ethical principle? Well, the fundamental conditions approach says, um, it turns out that res like, uh, respecting someone's decision is a, it's, it, that's one of the uh, uh, fundamental conditions, right? If, if people need to be able to decide for themselves what they want to do, right? And if they can, then they can't really uh, pursue you know, various basic activities. So the fundamental conditions approach can readily explain why autonomy and respect um, are sort of uh, 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 something like ethical principles that we should uh, respect uh, uh, here. Um, same with uh, non-maleficence. So that basically non-maleficence says do no harm. Um, and again, the fundamental conditions approach can explain that, right? So if, uh, if people are able to harm us, then it's gonna be very difficult for us to pursue the basic activities. So the fundamental conditions approach says, you know, we need to make sure that there's a principle that, that uh, lowers our risk of being harmed. 
whoops, going backwards. But there are other principles. So take value alignment. So is that an ethical principle? Well, um, um, so I think it's not, and here's why. So uh, the idea, again, value alignment says something like, you know, we should try to get algorithms to align with our human values. Well, first of all, human values vary very widely, right? So um, uh, if you think that, you know, there are people who are autocrats and dictators, surely we don't want algorithms to be aligned with those values, right? So just getting an algorithm to align with human values seems to be a bad idea. Now, you might think, well, maybe there's a different value, sort of like it's rather than aligning, uh, getting the algorithms to align with human values, we should get them to align with, say, the value of respect for humanity, right? Well, that, uh, the fundamental conditions can, approach can explain why that's a principle, right? Because, you know, we need to be treated, uh, you know, as ends in ourselves and not as mere means, uh, according to Kant. And there are good reasons why that would be, uh, you know, a fundamental condition. And so the fundamental conditions can, can explain that. So now I want to uh, explain how this approach can also give us, uh, tell us, you know, sort of, what ethical principles we should be paying attention to in the healthcare setting. So in healthcare algorithms, uh, you know, one of the things you can think about is sort of there's a spectrum of applications, you know, ranging from sort of inside a human organism all the way to sort of outside of the human organism. And um, so the, the uh, fundamental conditions approach can tell us why that's important. Right, because like, why does that distinction make a difference? Well, it says that uh, you know, if if an algorithm is going to operate inside a human organism, then one of the things it might do is affect our um, uh, our organismic uh, capacity, our basic health, basically. So our basic health is sort of um, this idea that you know we need to have various fundamental capacities to be working properly. So we have metabolism, respiration, so on and so forth, right? All those need to be uh, uh, function properly in order for us to, for example, to think. Uh, you know, if you have a flu or whatever, then it's very difficult for you to think about anything. Um, and so, um, so that's why a, a basic health is a fundamental condition, and that's why we have a right to basic health. And so uh, what, what the fundamental uh, conditions approach tells us is that we need the, uh, th there's a difference, there's an ethical difference between algorithms that operate inside an organism versus one that's outside, because the ones that's inside, at least it can affect basic health. So it tells us that, you know, we need to be, you know, so uh, take, imagine, for example, there's a smart pill that, you know, like in vivo sensor, you want to put it into somebody's body. Uh, the uh, this approach says well we need sort of maybe uh some sort of ethical scrutiny because it's going to be inside the human organism uh, another ethical consideration that it points to is uh this idea of bodily integrity right so uh take uh you know take this smart pill that you're going to be putting into somebody's body well people have a right to bodily integrity Right. So if you're going to put something into their body, you need to, for example, get their consent. You need to make sure that it's not going to adversely affect their organismic functioning and affect their basic health and so on and so forth. Right. And so the, uh, and why do we have a, a right to bodily integrity? Well, the fundamental conditions approach says, well, we need to be able to control what goes into our body. Just imagine you couldn't have control. You don't have control over what goes into your body. It would be very hard to do a bunch of the things that you want to do. Okay, so here let me talk about another spectrum uh, that uh, you know the there's another spectrum where healthcare applications can be applied. So this sort of ranges from um, sort of uh, you know like the algorithms can just sort of be inputs into human decision making all the way to just it makes its own decisions, right? So there are a lot of uh, uh, healthier uh, applications, take like your uh, smart watches. Um, it basically, it, it, it tells you sort of your heartbeat. It's sort of, it could be inputs to your decision. It tells you, you know, like, or, uh, you know, like the step counters. It tells you how many steps you've taken. 
It maybe recommends that you take more steps and so on and so forth. So things that um, make decisions on their own. So uh, one example might be sort of a robotic surgeon, so something that can kind of autonomous, uh, autonomously make incisions and uh, do things on its, its own. <clears throat> and what the fundamental conditions say is that there's actually a difference right here because um, in cases where uh, it's just an input into your decision making, you're still in control. <clears throat> so you can decide whether you're going to use this. You can take off your smartwatch. You can sort of not use certain AI applications. Uh, but if this thing is going to be making decisions on its own, then uh, that could override, you know, that could have an effect on you whether or not you want that effect, right? And this thing, uh, and so the fundamental conditions approach says, well, you know, if we're going to give robots, uh, you know, if they're going to have autonomous control, then that requires certain different types of scrutiny, right? <clears throat> so from here, we can actually distinguish four types of algorithms. So you got, um, you know, algorithm, algorithms that are inside a human organism and they make their own decision. Type two, they're outside the human organism and they make their own decisions. Um, and uh, type three, sort of uh, the algorithm operates inside the human organism, but they're in the human decision making or they're outside human organisms and but they're just inputs into human decision makings. And for our purpose, um, I think that, you know, we can actually the fundamental uh, uh, fundamental conditions approach can apply when you combine um, sort of uh, these algorithms in different ways. So just to use one example, imagine you want to use a BCI, right, a brain computer interface inside some sort of organism. And let's say that it's going to make decisions. It's going to sort of when you're uh, so BCIs right now can already be used for, say, Parkinson's disease. Right. Uh, and you can maybe embed it with machine learning so that it kind of monitors your, um, uh, you know, what happens inside, you know, when you have certain conditions, it sort of sends electric, automatically sends electrical signals to your brain to interrupt certain processes. Um, the, uh, the fundamental conditions approach says you got to pay attention to because this is inside an organism and it's making decisions on its own. You got to, you know, there are sort of different ethical, uh, like they're, you know, on both dimensions, you should be thinking about uh, sort of these ethical considerations. Okay, so now as we've seen a pressing uh, problem with uh, deep learning models is that uh, it's sort of, it's a black box. We don't, even programmers, like those who program these deep learning models, they don't really exactly know what's going on inside these models, right? Um, and, um, but and at the same time, the learning could be kind of superficial, right? Because like, uh, and we saw with the adversarial attacks, uh, they, uh, they're not really learning uh, real features of the world. It's kind of superficial. And that's why they're vulnerable to ad adversarial attacks. So what can we do uh, to sort of combat uh, this, this, this feature, right? Sort of this superficial model uh, while taking advantage of the fact that deep learning has all these benefits. Uh, so some people have suggested that we use something called locked algorithms, right? So basic, uh, the idea here is that you would take a certain uh, algorithms and you would just sort of lock it uh, uh, for a given set of data, right? As, a, as opposed to adaptive algorithms where you allow it to be continue, you allow the algorithm to be continually see updated as you get new inputs. Uh, in the case of locked algorithms, you just sort of, you just fix the inputs and then you, you, you sort of use that in specific context. And so the FDA, for example, has re been recommending that uh, if we're gonna be using sort of healthcare algorithms, they should be locked. Um, and I think the fundamental conditions approach can support that idea, right? Because uh, for the reasons that we've talked about, namely because it affects uh, for example, our basic health, it also, affect, it's, it also could affect our bodily integrity. Okay, let me just... Um, of course, there's a different op uh, option. You could also, uh, if you wanted to use adaptive algorithms, uh, 
then you could also hold the environment fixed. Um, and that's another way to go. So take, for example, a robotic surgeon. You might, uh, maybe you want to allow uh, it to use deep learning models and be able to update the data. But what you then do is you fix the environment. You sort of say, this thing can only do incision or suture, suturing, right? It can't do anything else. So it's not going to run around and accidentally cut off someone's head or someone's hand. Um, it's only going to, it's uh, been, even though it's using adaptive algorithms, it's being used in very specific uh, um, circumstances. So earlier I mentioned that there are these four algorithms. I won't um, go over uh, them again. And I think there are good reasons to think that, at least with uh, the first three types, we should be using locked algorithms. Right. Uh, so because uh, algorithms are inside human organisms and they make their own decisions, seems like uh, that could cause a lot of harm uh, to patients and so on and so forth. Uh, or even if they're outside the human organism, but they make their own decisions. So take like a robotic surgeon that could also cause certain uh, level of harm. Um, and sort of inside human organism, even though they're inputs into human decisions. So imagine a smart pill that just sort of detects your blood level or maybe certain, you know, like, and then sends information. Um, even so, it's inside the organism. So you might think uh, that uh, sort of, uh, that means, you know, we need to scrutinize it a bit more. Uh, so for those, uh, in those cases, uh, you might think uh, the recommendation should be something like we should use bot algorithms for now. Um, but of course, uh, the type four, uh, I think there, we don't necessarily need to use locked algorithms, but that doesn't mean that there are not other concerns. Uh, cause you know, just because an algorithm operates outside the human body and doesn't, it's just input into decision making, they can still do a lot of, you know, wreak a lot of havoc. Uh, just take social media, for example, right? Uh, they, they, you know, it can even cause wars and things like that. So there are other issues, but they're not raised by issues like bodily integrity, or uh, basic health. Um, at the same time, so you might think, well, um, if we have to use locked algorithms all the way, then uh, what's the point of these adaptive algorithms? Can we even take advantage of them? And so I wanna suggest that yes, we can, and maybe do something called um, sort of uh, uh, stepped, uh, staggered learning, right? So staggered learning basically involves uh, uh, so you'll have, uh, you'll have a set of fixed algorithms that you're using, but at the same time, you can have another model that is sort of learning, you know, uh, like collecting new data and learning, but you don't apply that model right away, sort of like in real time. What you do is you take the, you take the updated data set and maybe you run some sort of randomized control trial on the data, on the new sort of new algorithm to make sure that it's safe. And after it's safe, then you can, it's, you know, you've created a new set of locked algorithms and you can then use that to, you know, sort of you can then deploy that. So uh, the advantage of that is that it allows us to take advantage of some form of adaptive learning. And while at the same time, you know, we don't, you know, we're not just doing trial and error right in real time. Okay, so let me just conclude. Uh, I think the fundamental conditions approach offers a more unified and substantive uh, ethical framework for companies and AI researchers. And it also allows us to distinguish between ethical principles that are genuine and ones that are not. And moreover, it offers a principal way of sort of deriving and figuring out sort of what ethical issues we should be considering. So I think, you know, we should uh, be exploring this approach uh, more in the debate on AI ethics. Thank you very much. Do we stay here? Sure. I was wondering if you would mind talking more about the difference between the type three and four uh, systems. Because it seems like there's similar data that you can get from the type three and type four system, like your heart.
heart rate for a pacemaker versus your heart rate from a smartwatch that you're wearing. Um, so with the same data, it would seem like maybe we should use locked algorithms in both cases, but you can differentiate between the type three and four. Oh, great question. So. I was thinking that type three, uh, sh we, use, we should use locked algorithms just because it's inside the human organism, right? And so there are more things that could go wrong. It could interfere with your, uh, you know, life processes, uh, you know, things like cell division and things like that. And so that kind of kicks up a, a, a notch in sort of, uh, in terms of ethical concerns. Whereas uh, type four is sort of outside, so you can stop it any time, like it's not inside you kind of circulating around. Of course, you can stop the type three one inside your body as well, but it's still interacting with your human organism. It could kind of interfere. Um, and so that was the reason. Um, do you think that's a sufficient reason for thinking that we should uh, distinguish the two? Um, I think that is a good point. I appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if there's a middle ground though where something like an insulin pump mm -hmm. isn't exactly inside the body, but it does in a way. And whether that would be a type three or four device. That's a great question. So now we're getting into debates about vagueness, you know, sort of this is the, this thing's on your the surface of your thing, but it's pumping uh, things into your body. I think I would categorize that as a like more like a type three, right? Because now you, it's pumping things into your body uh, in a way that can sort of interact with your life processes, right? So it seems to me closer to a type three rather than a type four. Ima uh, consider a different thing where it's like it's more like a smartwatch and it's just um, just measure it's just monitoring your uh, sugar level of, of your blood. You know, and then it sort of gives you information, and then you can then decide whether to get an insulin or not, right? That would seem to me to be more like a type four. So, thank you. Thanks. It's kind of a shot in the dark, but are any cases where you worry about an algorithm not being adapted? People often not able to adapt. Uh, say that one more time. Missed so, the question. You, you would, you know, on these extra conditions, are you encouraging it with a given uh, problem if you're only able to adapt to the circumstances? So, in other words, so like you know the conditions for getting the right answer are changing. Right. Are there any cases like this that you're worried about? Or do you think a lot of that is always correct? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think that uh, because uh, of the way current uh, machine learning works, right, the way, because right now, uh, I think it tends to work more superficially. It doesn't understand causal relations and things like that. Um, I think that, uh, at least for now, um, we, sh we should be more cautious about using adaptive algorithms, especially if that's going to operate inside us. Um, now, I can imagine in the future where, you know, you got the machine learning is more like it's basically uh, they're kind of autonomous. They basically think the way we think. Right. Uh, and they can make decisions as well as we can or even better. Uh, in those cases, I'm not sure if adaptive. I mean, th those would still be adaptive because they're kind of thinking on the fly, but it would just be like. It would be more like a doctor, like someone next to you, sort of saying, hey, you should do this, and so on and so forth. But even then, you might think, um, like, uh, even if there's someone who's smarter than you, so the doctor is smarter than you, uh, at least in biomedical ethics, we think the principle of autonomy is very important, right? So we think that even if this doctor knows better, it's still up to me to decide whether I should take this uh, medicine or not. And I think that's right. Like, I think that's something that we should respect. Um, and um, that's, that doesn't mean that we don't have a duty to do it. So in like the case of vaccine, I have this, you know, I've written a paper where I ba basically says, uh, I basically say that um, people shouldn't for force us to be vaccinated, but at the same time, we may have a duty to ourselves to get vaccinated for, you know, for, because um, we need to protect our basic health 
we need to protect other people's basic health. But the duty doesn't mean that other people can therefore force this. So. Great. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Katie Creel. Katie Creel is a fellow at the Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence, AGI, and the Center for Ethics and Society at Stanford University. 